Hello there. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Joe. So this is unusual as a podcast for you and I, isn't it? Because, well, we're doing two things at once, aren't we, Johnny? Imagine that. We've got the podcast, we're recording the audio, so maybe you're listening on your phone, in bed, jogging, on the commute. Ooh. Or, perhaps, you're looking at this little camera as well and maybe you're watching on the YouTubes. It's a first for us, isn't it? Isn't Let's it radical? It isn't it's it radical? radical? How are you, Joe? I'm good, Johnny. All the better for seeing you, obviously. Oh, well, you saw me yesterday, didn't you, at the at the Forest Gate Jumble Trail? I know, that was a bit of fun, wasn't it? Yeah. Although, well, not just fun, we were actually there to make money. Okay, how did it go? Really well. Actually, we weren't there to make money, we were there to get rid of all my children's stuff and uh, clear the house. Okay, how did that... I, did, I must say, Joe, when I walked by, I did notice that one of the gifts that I gave one of your children was also on the sale. <laughs> yeah, but did you notice that I also whipped it back in and uh, okay. it's been saved? We still have that book of moon poetry. Well, you're welcome to it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so it was a good sale. Did the kids make some dollars? It was really good. It was nice to see my children in action, seeing that my son is a future salesperson because he was charming, delightful. He was quick on the money. Just, you know, if he saw someone was going to walk away... He soon knew to lower his prices and reel them in. Expert haggler. Expert haggler. And my daughter, who apparently doesn't like learning mm. uh, and doesn't really want to go back to school and learn because she had no interest in it, um, was able to add up quite well when money was involved. So hey, good that's... to see her in a different environment yeah. as well. Were they back this morning? Back to school this morning. Wow. Mm. How was it? Were they all oh, right? They were fine. Well, my son was nervous and then my daughter just strode in and then actually... They had to line up ready in the playground and her and her friend were just grinning from ear to ear. They couldn't stop smiling as they were looking at each other. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, nice start to the term. That's lovely. It is isn't lovely. It? And I get you all to myself because wow. my children aren't here. Aren't you lucky? I know. <laughs> Joe, would you like to hear my most recent ailment? Oh, another ailment. Is this going to become a theme? It might do. Hopefully okay. not. Hopefully not. Don't yeah. want to wish ill upon me, do we? But no, no. I've got a slight swimmer's ear this week. A swimmer's ear? A swimmer's ear. And what does a swimmer's ear feel like? Well, Joe, it feels like it is, which is that I've probably compacted a very healthy, I add, amount of earwax into like a <laughs> thick shield. Yes. Um, and like duffed in my uh, inner eardrum after swimming underwater for a while. I've got a lot of pressure. I've got tinnitus. How have you impacted it like that? Did you start sticking something in your ear? Well, my, my finger. But I thought that I was helping because it felt like I had pressure. I was like, I've got to get the pressure out. But I think what actually happened is, um, like putty, I've just like, what's the word? You know, like when you're sealing a window, what's that called? Yeah, putty, yeah. I've, I've putted myself. Yeah. I've done a putty in my ear. You know what you need to do instead of that? No. Actually get a little bit of olive oil. Ah. Uh, and okay, drip it into your ear, but don't do what I did with my husband, which was he was saying, Oh, I've got really ear that blocks. The Have you already fried the oil? Well, no, worse than that. The doctor said, Oh, you know, don't we don't do um, what's that thing where they rinse your ears out? We don't really do that anymore, but get some olive oil and put it in your ear. But I didn't really think about the fact that the head is not an empty vessel, so I got <laughs> a you, chunk of olive did oil. Did you do it via his nose? You no, know, no, he just tipped his head aside, but I just sort of kept pouring. <laughs> <laughs> Fill a litre jug. Oh, our bed was covered in olive oil. Gosh. There was olive oil gushing out of the ear. He couldn't believe what I was doing. And I hadn't thought he said like it's just a drop. So it was a bit of a disaster. We've not done that since. God, I bet your cleaner had some questions. I don't like to talk about it. Shall we talk Moving about something on. else? Moving wow. on. Yes. Well, on from that. There's ways that we can learn from past experiences, and that guides us into what we're talking about <laughs> yeah, today. I've learned from that one, definitely. Yes, which is reflection. Reflection. Reflection and reflective practice. Why are we doing this, Joe? Do you want me to tell you? Because that was, that was a rhetorical question. Wasn't it? Yeah, you tell me, Johnny. Well, Joe, as you know, you and I are launching something called the Connected Teacher Project. We are, aren't What we? is it, what you is ask it? at home? The Connected Teacher Project is a six-part teacher training course for early career teachers, perhaps in the first five years of their teaching career as primary teachers. And we were going to launch it this month, Jo, weren't we? But what did we discover? We discovered that teachers, you really need to get back into school and get sorted for a term before we start trying to force ourselves on you. Yeah, so we're going to give you that leverage of four months. And we're going to come back in January and run this course because that's what the head teachers we work with are saying would be the better time for it. And we like to be reflective. We're reflective like that, and we take feedback 
generously. We do. Generously received. So the idea of this podcast then is that we're going to introduce through six of the next episodes of this podcast the six themes of our six sessions of training. But you know what? Today we're going to start with reflection. Okay. So we think that learning to be reflective is a really important part of the teaching process, especially as you find your feet in the classroom in the first few years. And the learning that you undergo in that time is probably more accelerated, I would say, and more meaningful than what comes afterwards. Is that controversial? Do you feel like you learned more in your first few years of teaching than afterwards? I think I think you can do. I think I think it's really interesting. I think it really depends what environment you're in, mm. because I think everything is so new and so feels so fast paced in your first years that you could just bulldoze through that and not spend any time stopping and thinking. And I think that can happen. But I think those moments of learning then, you're right, have huge impact because they're very raw and you've got nothing else to go on mm. and they're normally quite significant. When you get something wrong, you often get it wrong, really wrong in your first few years and you don't have that experience to go, oh that's gone wrong, let's deal with it on the spot. So they tend to hit you harder. Mm. And also the wins, you know, those wins are just so exhilarating because you're not used to that experience either. Yeah, it's a weird one. How did you come into teaching, Jo? I came into teaching, oh yes, I didn't come directly into teaching, I used to be a video editor, ah. um, but I left university and my friend was earning ridiculous amounts of money in the city and mm. wanted to do something with that money, so his brother and I had gone to university together and we set up a post-production company because he had this amazing new IT um, software that he was writing that really is linked to 3D animation that hadn't been come, come out then. Anyway, we set up a business, flopped completely in two years, having learned an awful lot, and then a friend of mine was doing a PGCE, and I thought, do you know what, that sounds like a great idea. And I've never looked back. Oh, and here we are. Mm. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Well, Joe, not to put you on the spot, but I was thinking that for the benefit of those listening, viewing, taking yeah. part at home, um, I'm going to take you on a reflective journey, Joe Castro. Oh, a reflective journey. Get your nostalgic helmet on. Okay. We're getting in our pedagogy TARDIS. Okay. Yeah? Sounds that scary. Sound nice? Well, that's what we're going to be doing. So I want for this to be something that's useful for those people who are listening. So not only are we saying that reflection is a useful thing to undergo, I want to share some strategies and ideas of how we might do it. Brilliant. So Joe, we're going to go back to my time. When I started, I did teach first back in the hallowed age of 2011. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we were encouraged to do in our training year was to undergo this process called the critical incident approach. Sounds interesting. It does, it sounds dramatic. So with the critical incident approach, the idea is that you reflect on specific moments that felt really significant in your practice. Mm -hmm. So it might have been you know, some, a change in your mind, it might have been a change in the way you think about something, or it might have been an event in the classroom. And for the fact that you've understood it to be significant, mm -hmm. it gives you a lot to work with in your reflection. So you go through a series of questions and unpick it. So even by choosing an incident, you've already started to be reflective mm. before you even, because you've had to have noticed. That's right. So I say paying attention is the first thing to being reflective, isn't it? I would say so okay. too. That's really interesting. Hmm. And I, I do, yeah, maybe question slightly, why is it that certain things you hang on to? Because I bet if I would changed my mind about certain things in my first year, there were opportunities to reflect that probably passed me by until a bit later on. Hmm. You've got different perceptions, don't you, as a trainee and as a new teacher than as a more established one. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Well, okay. the idea is then that this is an approach that you might take with your own teaching you can do this in the written form, or you could do it like Joe and I are going to do, with Joe's permission, of course, mm, yeah. um, as a kind of conversation. And it can be a conversation with somebody else. Or if you're lonely, you can converse with yourself. So, Joe. Can I add something to that? You may. Because I do a lot of work on peer coaching. Oh, okay. And I actually think sometimes these conversations with a peer, someone at the same level, you know, same experience as you, can be even more productive than with someone that is your line manager or someone that has a lot more experience. Mm. It can kind of have a different dynamic. So it might be worth thinking about doing it with different people as well. Okay, well that makes sense. Okay. Well let's reach out then. Let's, let's all reach it. out. Covid specifically, I'll elbow you. Thank you. Reaching out. 
So Joe, thinking about your first few years of teaching, what I'd want you to do first of all is just isolate any particular moments that you feel remained very significant for you. Any moments that changed the way that you viewed yourself as a teacher in those first few years? Yeah, I mean, that's quite easy in that I can still feel the feelings I had in that moment. <laughs> so I would what say... What happened? Tell me about what was going okay. on in this moment. So in this moment, I had, in those days, because this is going back to 2001, I think it was, um, when Ofsted were coming, you had six months to prepare. So you knew Ofsted were coming for six months. And I was in my first year of teaching and obviously knew everyone was terrified of Ofsted. The whole school was kind of building up to it and the whole six months before were, were crazy, trying to get everything in order and really planning lessons for this one week in time. And during that week, one of the lessons that I planned was on the Spanish Armada. And I probably spent a ridiculous, well I did spend a ridiculous amount of time drawing or copying images of um, ships and basically making a whole fleet for the Spanish Armada, getting a map on the board, tacky backing, because they didn't even have a laminator in those days, so tacky backing is the old way of laminating, which takes hours, and put all my effort into making resources for this lesson. And it came to week of Ofsted. This lesson was, I was teaching this lesson, and you know, like you don't know when they're coming in the room. In the middle of teaching this lesson, with all my fancy resources on the board, I just stood there and thought, I don't know what the point of this lesson is. I have no idea why I've done all this. I have no idea what I want the children to learn from this. And I just basically spent the rest of that 40 minutes thinking, please don't walk in the door. Please mm. do not walk in the door because this lesson I know is a fail. So would you say that the lesson itself was the significant event or was it more your change of thinking in that moment? It was my realisation in that moment that I put all this effort in and I thought I'd got this great lesson because I've really focused on me at the front, me performing, me making great resources, me looking like this whiz bang mm. teacher and looking great. And actually I had no content. And I just remember feeling in front of the class, the dread. And that was the longest 40 minutes of my life at that point. They didn't come in, thank goodness. Mm. But it would have been an inadequate lesson. Mm. And it's interesting that this is something that has stuck with you. So. I can see why that would have been very significant and, you know, emotional at the time. Why do you think this has remained significant for you to this day? What is the significance of it now? Because it, it's such a learning point. I changed how I approached planning from that day on. That moment of that horror of being caught out, I felt like I was going to get caught out. I'm quite a, a crowd pleaser. Mm -hmm. I've always been quite high achieving. I, as a teacher, I, I took, took to it like a duck to water. I was, you know, always getting good um, mm. observations. And suddenly I thought when the observations apparently really matter and can have an impact on the school, the whole community, I'd completely come up with this lesson that was gonna fail. Mm. So it hit me really hard and I just thought, what on earth are you doing? And the learning is that learning is never about you and your performance at the front it's about what the children are doing so it significantly changed how i then planned every other lesson mm. so what, what would you say you were worried about then so it, let's say if obstead had come in and seen that lesson as you had planned it what were your concerns at that point well it's all about me i have to say isn't it yeah <laughs> it's all about me and how it's going to make me look mm. <laughs> not about whether the children was a waste of their 45 minutes mm. but you tend to think inwardly and you tend to you know, and that's a real, that's my other big learning through teaching, that it really isn't about me. And I think you can try and strive to be a big personality teacher, and we're often really obsessed with the big personality teachers that really have that charisma and the class are completely engaged by that person. But they're not always the most effective teachers and you don't have to be the big person at the front where the kids adore you. Mm -hmm. Actually, they adore you when you let them take over and you let them think and put them at the centre of the learning rather than you. So was it an immediate change then, would you say? Like, did your actions change after you'd had that change in your thinking? No, and I probably, no, not instantly, but the more I developed as a teacher, then I've become a coach, and then I was um, head of teaching and learning, I realised, and then actually going into school that went into special measures, mm. and thinking we were quite a good school. And, you know, many things were good about the school. However, 
when I then helped those teachers who were getting inadequate in their lessons, it literally came down to them, stop thinking about what you have planned and what you're doing and listen to the answers that the children give you mm. and pay attention to what's happening in front of you, not what you're doing. And when you shift that focus to the children and the learning, you can only be in a better p position. Yeah, that's really interesting. What, so like that, the reflection that you had and that change of thinking became more useful to you later on then? I mean, probably even then, mm. but I was still very, a new teacher and I was working in a team and we planned together. Mm. So I had less impact. You know, you can feel quite intimidated if you're working with more experienced teachers. They were lovely mm. and they were great, but you kind of feel like you're bringing less to the party mm. than they are because they've got so much experience. So I, th I don't think it would have had a huge impact then. Um, and also it was a time that the literacy and numeracy strategy came out and actually most people observing you were looking at you. Mm. So it was a fault in the whole system. And really, until I was observed by um, an HMI inspector who, and I observed alongside her much later on as well, and she asked me what I'd grade the lesson, and I said inadequate, and she said, no, it wasn't. She said, the teacher did a terrible job, but the children still learn. It's not inadequate. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, yes. Oh, yeah. Mm. Sometimes children learn in spite of us. That's so, interesting. really interesting as well. And she was an amazing woman amazing woman so I learned a lot so you never stop learning and mm -hmm. you know even then she was right I, everything had gone wrong for the teacher in some way in theory and I was still even at that point with all this th this concentration of children I still then reverted in that stressful situation to looking at the teacher when I'm being asked to give a grade because I was thinking that's what she thought I should do mm. do you feel this would be kind of the last question and it's not really within that structure but more as a follow-on do you feel that this moment contributed to you shaping your values as a teacher? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's fundamental to, to how I teach now, mm -hmm. that I, it's about the children, not about me at the front. It's about doing things that work for those children. And you can plan a lesson. We were talking about this earlier today. I've also been in situations where I've been in a school and I teach the same lesson to four different classes. And it's such a good, thing to do because mm. teaching the same lesson to four different classes is so powerful because then you really know what the important bits are in that lesson and what's the mm. frippery and the things that you don't really need or also how some children will just follow something or something will become of interest in that lesson that you didn't see depending on the group of children. So, mm -hmm. yeah, That's great. What do you think of that as a model then to kind of guide your reflections about elements of your work? Well I like that because it I had to really think about a crucial moment, so mm. already I'm really thinking through all of my different years. I'd forgotten that moment until you asked me that question. Interesting. So, I, and I'd for, I actually have never traced to see how significant that moment was. Mm. The feeling of um, anxiety, and it's really interesting that the feeling of anxiety came flooding back, and of being caught mm. out, and of, being, of letting people down. Um, so actually when you're asking how you feel, feel then is really important as well because feelings can override mm -hmm. you reflecting clearly. Yeah, especially... So the feeling of shame could have just memory. taken over that, but it's good to remember that because it's why was that so significant then? Mm. Why did, those feelings and then the intellectual side of why those feelings are happening. So separating those is really useful. So that is like one of the one of the approaches, I guess, and one of the exercises that we might build into what we do in this session that we will have as part of the Connected Teacher Project. And it's, I guess it's an example of the kind of thinking that we feel is really supportive of a longer term connection mm. with being a teacher, because it is a journey. Yeah. And it would be wrong to think that because you've done well in your training year or you've done well in your NQT year, you are now the finished article. Yeah. And nobody really does think that way, do I still? No, I mean, I, I, I don't think I was overconfident. No. Um, however, I like to be seen to be doing well because I feel like that's mm. my high standards, set myself a high yeah. standard and we probably, and the more I coach people, interestingly, the more that's come out. When I coach people, we often are people that really want to learn and develop, have very high expectations of themselves. 
and are quite unforgiving of themselves. Mm. Um, but we can get caught up in it being about us and not look outwards. So looking outwards is so much more important than just going, what have I done, what have I done, where am I in this? Look at the impact what you're doing is having, not just on what you're doing. And I think that's been a massive learning for me over the years. Mm -hmm. Can I say one other thing as well? I, I chose a negative moment, mm. but also it's just as important to choose the winning moments to look at. So I wouldn't want people to always do their reflective practice on something that's gone wrong, because we don't often focus on what went well, because how do we know to do that again? Mm -hmm. So please pay attention to what you do well and do this activity with that, because actually, then you understand what went well and you could do more of it yeah. rather than focusing on stopping doing something that didn't work. Mm. I think it's quite nice to reflect too. You know, I think to have the ability to step back from what we do day to day, yeah. which often forces into a kind of autopilot mode, it's quite good to be able to pause and reflect. I, I feel I appreciate it more now, having taught for longer, to be able to reflect back on those first few years. I mean, maybe something to do with, like for me at the moment, I'm going to start working again at the school where I started as a trainee like nearly a oh, decade yes. ago. So it's all been fresh in mind that first few years and the learning that comes from it. And I, I think maybe we can broaden it and say that whilst we are talking about this as an early career teacher project, certainly from my own perspective, and I, I get the feeling that you share the view, like digging back into your own early teaching career is a really interesting way to unpick the teacher that you've become to look at it alongside the teachers that we want to be. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, as you were um, talking there, I was thinking more as, as well about, um, oh, it's gonna go out of my head now, Johnny. Isn't nah. it funny how that happens? Nah. That we should be doing this for the children. So often as well, you know, everyone does the lesson and it's the plenary and, mm. and you always hear, oh, that didn't, didn't do the plenary or the plenary is not that important and then it gets left. If we feel how important it is for us to reflect on our learning, we really need to be providing the opportunity for the children to do. And what you've done here, there's no reason you can't do that with, with your so children really in your class. Point. It chimes with the way that we approach writing, doesn't it? And yeah. you know, the idea of children's authentic experiences and their anecdotes as being something worthy of discussion yeah. and inclusion in a writing classroom. Well, writing classrooms link to this as well. So yeah. I think this works well as a discussion, like yes. we've been doing, but also it works well as a reflective writing mm -hmm. task um, it's quite a useful habit to get into. I've started doing something called the morning pages, which is part of Ooh. some uh, like well-being based approach to writing where every morning I'm trying to write three pages of A4. And partly that's just to build up your writing stamina, but partly it's interesting to see what comes out when you quite absentmindedly force yourself to write. So it's is it about anything? Yeah. So oh, like okay. for, for me, sometimes it's, you know, if you've got stuff on your mind, you're juggling it all. It's just a way of organising it through writing it. Sometimes I might write a spontaneous smutty limerick, Joe. <laughs> Sometimes a poem or two. Sometimes it's just like those, you know, angsty teenage diary sort of things. Yeah. Like, oh, why is everything going wrong? Oh. It just means you get to pour out your emotional responses. Mm. And I think at a time when teaching is going to be hard this year, um, just the process of writing for its own sake, not to create a particular thing, the process of writing is quite a healthy one for many of us teachers to engage with. Definitely. Well, Definitely. I was going to share one more thing with the good people, Joe. Oh, go on. Then. I was going to share, since we've been talking about writing as a form of reflection, I was going to talk about reading as a form of reflection. Ooh, mm -hmm. Tell me more. I will. So, here are three books which are really brilliant about classroom life. One of them is Kate Clanchy's Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me. Um, it won the Orwell Prize. It's a really brilliant encyclopedic sort of coverage of Kate Clanchy's career as a teacher and as a writer and of the intersection between the two. And she's worked in lots of different settings. So up in the Highlands in Scotland, out in Essex and in her current school in Oxford. A really brilliant read. Another one, um, Edward Blishen. Um, Edward Blishen wrote lots of books about his uh, time as a teacher. Um, one about his teacher training, one about his first years in a private school and another one when he moved into a uh, large state comprehensive. I really like one of the books called <gasps> This Right Soft Lot. Oh, I like that as a title. It's a nice title, yeah, isn't it, Joe? I like it. Tell nice me more title. about it. 
I'll tell you more about it. So in this Right Stuff lot, he is talking a lot about the individual students that he teaches and their lives and things like that. But what I really liked about it was the way he writes about his colleagues, some really eccentric colleagues whose approach to teaching is very different from his own. Um, and it kind of tracks how he learns to appreciate them, not necessarily always like them, but how he learns to appreciate that care looks different in the hands of different teachers and that different teachers express their love for teaching and for their students in different ways. I think that's so important. Yeah. I'm going to have a read of that one. It's a good one. Yeah. Oh, the last one I'll throw out is especially good for some of you who might be listening who are in your first few years of teaching and it's called Becoming a Teacher by a teacher called Herbert Cole. So he's very much a progressive. I'm happy to come out as progressive on this, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> I give this to you, world. Um, teacher in New York and he's talking about his experiences as again as he becomes a new teacher working in this urban setting coming to terms with his own privilege coming to terms with the differences between his life and his students lives but also looking at how he tries to build community um, and become a part of the community which is already there so important mm -hmm. well they sound like really good reads thanks joe well there's plenty more of them and joe and i are going to put a range of our suggestions up on the website as well so if you go on to www.otherwiseeducation.com you can click the little tab where it says the other podcast the other podcast there is no other podcast <laughs> there is no other stop <laughs> you'll find all the information there um and also you'll find the the critical incident analysis and approach the structure oh, thank you johnny because i was going to ask you about mm. that because i was going to just summarize what we've done yeah. today oh, thank in you. this podcast is that okay please uh, so what have we done today? We've talked about being a reflective teacher and I think the main points are that it's not an extra, it's not an add-on. Being reflective is a really important part of your teaching. So make time for it. Don't just think that that's actually self-indulgent nonsense. It isn't. So try and get into the habit of doing it regularly. And you can do that through what approach? The critical incident approach. Which, if you can't remember the questions, don't worry about it, because like Johnny just said, you can go and look at the website and then the list of questions. Because mm. having a formal structure for those conversations can be really useful. Yes, yes. And then finally, we've got some great reading to go away and do for some wider reading on becoming a teacher. Yeah. What a great journey for us all. So thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Our next episode is going to be all about active listening and coaching, drawing on Joe's expertise. Can't wait for that one. Nor can I. Shall we go and get a sandwich? Oh, yes, please. I'm hungry. We hope you all have sandwiches, be it <laughs> literal or metaphorical. The sandwich of knowledge between us two little loafy slices over here. We're pushing it now. Let's say goodbye, Johnny. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Loafy slice? <laughs>